Continue our journey in chapter 13. We're moving on to section 13.2. So learning outcomes and expectations, feel free to pause and read through those before we move forward. All right, so now we're gonna dive into equilibrium constants. And there's a few rules and qualifiers we have to be aware of, like the phase of the reaction matters, there's ways to mathematically manipulate K. And then also we're gonna talk about uh, what if it's not at equilibrium? How do we figure out how it's gonna shift to reach that equilibrium condition with a reaction quotient? And so in the previous video, we talked about the equilibrium constant equation. And so it's the general formalism. If we have an equilibrium A plus B giving us C plus D, the equilibrium constant is proportional to products over reactants. In this case, C to the C, D to the D, A to the A, B to the B. It's a ratio of products to reactants and also known as the law of mass action. And so the thing we have to take into consideration when drawing this equation is that phase matters. Whether something's solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous, it's going to change how we write this equilibrium equation. And so um, for homogeneous reactions, we're having gas, gas, or aqueous, aqueous, or liquid, aqueous. Um, they're both going to be in the same phase. So this is just like catalysis where we have homogeneous catalysis. They're in the same phase. Same thing is true with equilibria. Likewise, you can have heterogeneous equilibria where things are in different phases. And so depending on the phase, it's going to dictate how we write that equation. And so Let's just start with a few options of this. And so one thing to note is if you have gas or aqueous, those are included in this equation, but the concentration of pure liquids are not included in the equilibrium constant expression. And so we'll take this example. So this is acetic acid, which is vinegar. You throw that in uh, water, which would be the solvent H2O, and then you end up with this acid-base chemistry. And so you can see aqueous, 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 but this is liquid. And for all intents and purposes, this concentration of the liquid is gigantic. And so for the most part, what ends up happening is if something is in a liquid phase, we remove it from the equilibrium equation. It basically says this number is going to change so small that it's not going to affect this calculation. It has to do with activities. And if you guys take analytical chemistry, you'll learn more about this. But for the sake of our class, we remove pure liquids from our equilibrium equations. And so it's still products over reactants. But if we notice one of the reactants is a pure liquid, we remove it from the equation and draw the equilibrium constant expression like this. Likewise, same thing with solids. We don't include solids in these equilibrium equations. And so if we have calcium uh, carbonate going to calcium oxide plus CO2, you'll notice solid, solid gas. We're going to remove the two solids from our equilibrium equation, products over reactants, the stoichiometry, and we ultimately end up with an equation that looks like this. So the equilibrium constant is directly proportional to the concentration of CO2. And so again, liquids are not included in the equation, neither are solids. And this is a bit counter intuitive and particularly this example because if we start with calcium carbonate CaCO3 and we just let it sit over time it's going to reach equilibrium it's going to generate CO2 molecules plus some CaCO3 and CaO. Uh, note it's not going to separate in nice piles like this this is just a depiction for the sake of looking at it but it basically says you know it's going to reach an equilibrium condition and what's interesting is it doesn't depend on the amount of CaCO3 or CaO because we know our equation K is equal to CO2. And so as long as we have uh, CaCO3, it's gonna generate a certain amount of CO2. And similarly, if we have CaO and CaCO3, it's still gonna generate the same amount of CO2. So it doesn't matter if you start out with more CaCO3 and then CaO, or CaCO3 than, than CO, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be the same amount of CO2 because it's entirely, uh, the, the, the equilibrium constant is proportional to CO2. Again, it's counterintuitive, but the solid is removed from the equilibrium calculation, which means the pressure of CO2 is going to be the same regardless of the concentrations of the solids. There's other things we can talk about with K. So we, we want to remove liquids and solids because those aren't going to be important in those calculations, and you'll learn why in later classes. Uh, we can also do mathematical manipulations of K. And so we can draw a reaction A to B. K is equal to B over A, products over reactants. There's no reason we can't also draw the equation this way, right? If, if this is a product going to a reactant going to product and product going to reactant, we can draw it both directions. And if we do, we draw a different equilibrium, where in this case, product is A, reactant is B, A over B. And there's a direct relationship between these two. So whatever your forward reaction is, K, 
If you take one and divide by K, you're getting the equilibrium constant of the reverse. And so because it's double-sided arrows, you can draw this both ways. The important thing to note about this is that anytime you report an equilibrium constant, you have to report the equation that you're using to get that number. And so you have to say if it's A to B or B to A, because they're going to give you two different numbers. And so if you're going to draw an equilibrium constant, you have to say it's for a given equilibrium. The other thing you can do is you can multiply the uh, the balanced equation by a factor and it'll change the, uh, the, the equilibrium expression by that factor. And so we can have an equilibrium A to B, there's your equilibrium expression. If you change the stoichiometry here, you could put this as a 2, this as a 2, you're just changing those effectively by an exponent of 2. And so it's not the most simplified balanced equation in this case, but there's some reasons why you would want to do this. But if you do that, it will change your equilibrium constant k. And the way it'll change it is by that exponent x. And so if you're going to change the stoichiometry of this, it's going to change this number by uh, exponent of x value. And so if you want to do that, you just have to take that into account when calculating the k. And again, you have to report if it's this equation you're drawing k for or this equa equation you're drawing k for. Um, the other thing is we can combine equilibrium constants together. And so just like you can have a multi-step reaction, you have multiple equilibria together in a row. You can effectively find an overall equilibrium for these, uh, the, the multiplier of all the equilibrium constants along the way. And so the equilibrium constant for step one, the equilibrium constant for step two, the equilibrium constant for step three, that gives you an overall equilibrium for the reaction. And so you can get an overall equilibrium for a multi-step process. And so this is what that looks like graphically. So we have a two-step process here. Earlier we talked about one step going forward in reverse. Well, a two-step process, we can go forward. We can also go reverse. There's an equilibrium constant for this one. There's an equilibrium constant for this one. There's an equilibrium constant for step one, equilibrium constant for step two. We can combine those together and get an overall equilibrium constant. And we do that the same we do for all our addition of equations together. We get A plus B. C plus D is uh, intermediate in in this case, and we're getting product E plus F. And so the overall equilibrium is simply multiplying the equilibrium constants of each step together. So this times this gives you K overall, or just multiplying these, cancel those out, you get an overall equation. And so you can double check the math. Each one of these is products over reactants. We're just combining them together algebraically to get K overall. And so this equilibrium constant equation, it's, it's really useful. It gives you an equilibrium, tells you if it's favoring products or reactants, but what else can you do with it? And so you can determine if a reaction has an equilibrium. You can also predict which way the reaction will shift to reach equilibrium condition. And so um, you can uh, perturb the reaction to make it shift any direction you want. And so the K is a really valuable tool in that respect. And so we're going to cover these first two in this video. Um, but one thing we'll talk about is a reaction quotient. And this is a useful abstraction to think about, you know, where is the system in relation to equilibrium? And so reaction quotient, the formal definition, measures the relative amounts of products and reactants present during the reaction at any particular point in time. Well, what does that mean? It's, it's basically at equilibrium, we use this equation, right? K, the equilibrium constant, is equal to products over reactants. But we can do that same math at any time we want, right? Whether it's at equilibrium or not, we can do this calculation for products over reactants. Reactants. And the reason you would want to do that is because this Q tells you where it is relative to K. And so it tells you if it's at equilibrium or it's going to shift to be equilibrium. And so that's what the reaction quotient is. It's the exact same equation as equilibrium constant, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing this math at equilibrium. And so again, same equation, but you can calculate it any time. And so um, this Q value will change as the reaction progresses, and eventually when it reaches equilibrium, Q will equal K. And so comparing those two values tells you which way the reaction will shift to reach equilibrium. And so here's the two equations again. K is for when it's under equilibrium conditions. Q is for any time. And so if you do the math on Q, and Q ends up being equal to K, you're at equilibrium, right? You were, you were essentially doing the calculation when it's over here. But you can also do this calculation at any other time when it's not reached equilibrium. And so if Q, when you calculate this value, is less than K, it basically tells you there's, there's too much reactants, right? Um, Q is less than K. It basically tells you this number's too big, this number's too small, and it's going to shift to make more C and D until it reaches Q 
equals K. And so here's the language. There's too much reactants, not enough products. The reaction will proceed to the right. It'll churn, turn some of this into this, and it'll generate more products and consume reactants until it reaches equilibrium condition. Uh, likewise, or in, inversely, if Q is greater than K, there's too much product, there's not enough reactant. This number's too big, this number's too small. And the way to fix that is to proceed left. And so you're gonna turn C and D into A and B until you reach a condition where Q equals K. And so this Q value effectively tells you which way it's gonna shift. Will it generate more products? Will it generate more reactants? And it wants to get that K equilibrium condition. So here's just an example, a quick quick math on reaching Q equals K. And so it says you have a mixture that's at equilibrium. A is 2.8, B is 1.2. Uh, there's a bunch of different scenes below. The question is which one's at equilibrium, which one's not at equilibrium, and which way will this shift? And so first we gotta calculate K. And so what this effectively tells us right here is we have an equilibrium mixture, that's the ratio of A to B. And so if we plug those numbers into this equation here, we get a equilibrium constant of 0.43. And so that first line tells us what K is equal to, 0.43. And so that's the equilibrium condition. The question is, where are these? And so these could be at equilibrium or they might not be. And so what we're gonna effectively do is calculate the ratio of B, which is the blue spheres, to A, which is the red spheres, and that's going to tell us the value Q. And so 8 blue, 2 red, that gives us 4. 3 blue, uh, 7 red, 0 0.43. Uh, 4 versus 6, 2 versus 8. And so all we've done is taken a ratio of products to reactants and we calculated the Q quotient. And so you can see in all these, that's 4, 0 0.43, 0 0.67, 0 0.25. Only one of them is equal to 0 0.43. And that effectively tells us B here is at equilibrium. And so the other ones are clearly not at equilibrium, right? Because Q does not equal K. And so this one's Q is greater than K. This has to shift left or proceed left to generate more reactants. Um, this one here is also greater than K. So it's going to have to turn B into A to reach equilibrium. And this one is less than K. 0 0.25 is less than 0 0.43. And so in order for Q to equal K, you're going to have to proceed to the right. A will convert to B until you generate enough B where this is going to eventually equal 0 0.43. And so just by knowing the equilibrium constant of 0 0.43, you can take any condition and predict which way is it going to go? Is it going to generate more product, more reactant, or is it happen to be at equilibrium already? All right, so that closes out this section. We talked about equilibria. They can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Uh, we don't include solids and liquids in the equilibrium calculation. We can also do mathematical manipulations of K where one over K is the reverse reaction or drawn in the reverse way. You can multiply K's together. You can put extinction or, uh, exponent or powers on it to change the, uh, the stoichiometry. We also talked about Q and Q being something we can calculate anytime and how the relationship between Q and K uh, dictates which way it will proceed or if it's at equilibrium already. So really valuable in terms of the prediction front. All right, so that closes out our introduction to chemical equilibria as we'll talk about equilibrium constants and how you manipulate them and, 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 and Q relative to K. And in 13.3, we'll dive into Le Chatelier's principle and this idea of perturbing equilibrium and understanding how the system will respond.